For the last time in the 23-24 season, it's the Battle of Alberta. We get you set for the Oilers at the Flames right here on the Oil Stream pregame show. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. Tom Gazzola with you alongside my good friend, YouTube Trev. There he is. He's all excited as we get you set for the 46, 24, and 5 Oilers taking on the 34, 36, and 5 Flames in game number 76 of the season for your orange and blue. As always, join the conversation. Text us 780-218-9999 or get into the nasty chat if you're watching on our YouTube channel. Of course, hit the thumbs up on your way in. Tell your friends, as Dusty likes to say, as uh, we continue to rock and or roll here on EST. We've got a great show for you. As always, uh, the order is coming off a 6-2 win against Colorado here at Edmonton. Last night, they hopped on the plane, and they got to Calgary at a, I don't know, reasonable time, I suppose. Probably got there 11.30-ish, I would say, 12. And then right to bed, no morning skate, and uh, they'll be ready to go for tonight's tilt down at the Saddle Dome. And YouTube Trev is pumped up. We've got Patrick Steinberg, Patrick Bartholomew Steinberg, joining us from Sportsnet 960. Ed Calgary, our dear friend, as well as Matt Cassian, just after 7 with Game Changers. And if you've got any questions, comments, if you want to recap last night's game, we're here for it. We're here for it, 780-218-9999, or on the Nasty Chat via our YouTube channel. I saw a couple of texts that actually came in not long ago. Bad Billy is very excited. Bad Billy texted at 5 o'clock. Yeah. Bad Billy says, hey, Tommy, and Cass when he gets here, be nice to see a repeat performance of last night's till Calgary has nothing to lose and last game tried some gooning. Nice to see Carrick in the lineup in case any buffoonery takes place. The Oil do not need to have any stars gooned up tonight. Win the game and the season series 3-1. Then last guy out, leave the old bag of flaming dog poop outside the Flames locker room for one of the Flames to stomp out. Uh, that's from Bad Billy. And then uh, another one came in here from, is this Frithy? Yeah, Frithy says, nothing fires me up more than hearing Yanmark's pregame lineup reading. All right, Frithy. That Matthias Janmark, he's a character. He's a character. I like it. Uh, thank you for the text. Keep those coming in. 780-218-9999. Pat Steinberg on the way shortly because he's, he's got his own show to do. Gosh darn it. And that starts at 7 o'clock. So we're going to try to get Patty on for as long as possible because he's uh, absolutely tremendous. And it's great to be able to have him on our show and our station. We weren't able to do that back in the old station days. That's for sure. He's ready to go. He is Patrick Bartholomew Steinberg from Sportsnet 960 in Calgary. And, uh, you know, people didn't know this, Pat, but according to me, of course, you and Dustin Nielsen share the middle name Bartholomew, correct? Oh, absolutely. I don't think, I don't think that, uh, I don't think if you looked at us, you could, you could really tell that. But once you, uh, once you sit down for a pint, I think that, uh, I think it becomes pretty evident. I just, uh, <laughs> I just finished the uh, harrowing walk across the ice oh. for uh, to get to the best box here at the Scotiabank Saddle. I did that for you, Tom. I appreciate that. I haven't done it in two years, and I don't miss it whatsoever. I'm one of those guys or one of those people that has to hold on to both railings just to make sure. And I always start thinking, what if something just fell and it went through the scoreboard on the ice during play? And I feel like that that's happened at times before, Patty. Has it not? I have never witnessed it. I came about as close to it as anybody about three or four years ago. Just dropped a Dasani water bottle. No. Right suspended it, and, and it hit the ground. It tilted over. No. And then as it was about to fall over, it tilted back, and oh. it did not go onto the, uh, onto the ice surface. It would have been right in the middle of the play, too, like, Somebody would have somebody would have definitely tripped over it. There would have been a torn ACL or something like that. So oh, I got lucky. No. You know what? Just blame Ryan Dietrich for it if it happened. Right? I do that. I do that. I do that most days. What a beautiful man he is. 
He is a very good man. I had the pleasure of working with him at the Oilers for three or four years. Now he's a member of the Flames Digital Department. Uh, Patty, what's the vibe like in Calgary going into this? What's the last BOA of the season? I know the, the Flames didn't have the year that they wanted, but what are you, what are you sensing in Calgary today? Um, I mean, I think that there's a little excitement for this game, no doubt about it. It's still, it's still a big deal whenever the Flames and Oilers play, so... I think in, in that respect, there's a, a little bit of a buzz about this game, although I just finished my uh, drive into the arena and it is, I don't know, 70% Oilers fans. So I think it's going to be a very blue crowd here because I think tickets are going to be a little easier to get for Oilers fans tonight. But I think there's a buzz. I think there's, a, I think there's a, an excitement and, and just the ability to maybe – with six games to go, have one more kind of signature game before the season comes to an end. But by and large, Tommy, the buzz around this place is, is it's pretty low. There's not, they're, they're playing out the string and they have been playing out the string since the trade deadline. And I think people have known where this thing is going for quite some time. So as a result, you know, the buzz around this team, the podcast numbers and page views and listeners and viewers and everything has, has just taken a step back because Flames are in a spot they haven't been in for quite some time. It's been about a decade since it's been clear they're not going to be a playoff team. There's been lots of years where they haven't made the playoffs, mm -hmm. but they've been still playing meaningful hockey into the final 10, final five games of the year. They haven't played a meaningful game here, Tommy, in probably two, three weeks. And so I think that, I think that can be difficult. I think it can be draining on a fan and, especially when you're two years removed from a battle of Alberta. And you just saw now this year, so many key core players lead. It's uh, I, I think it's going to be a, I'm trying to think of the right word. I think it's going to be a, a difficult end of the season for fans to be super dialed in on. And then the off season and going into next year, I think you'll start to see that buzz and the excitement start building again. Pat Steinberg from the Fan 960 in Calgary joining us now from the Saddle Dome. And it's crazy because, like, Patty, two years ago, this is a Flames team that won the Western Conference, and we had that great series in the second round. And I know the hope was that in the following years we'd be seeing this a few times at least, and there's, like, these great cores and nucleuses on both teams. And, and now all of a sudden we're talking about a Flames team. You said, you know, playing out the stretch, one win in their last eight games, haven't played a relevant game in two to three weeks. And uh, where are we at with this Calgary Flames team? And, and what's your sense of what Craig Conroy's trying to do with it here? Well, I think where they are is they have kind of, they've made their first step towards reshaping this group. And, and that first step was dealing with all of the stuff that was on Craig Conroy's plate. So when he took over from Brad Tree Living in May of last year, he had a lot to deal with. He had six key players that didn't have contracts going into this into next season. They were into their final years of contracts. And, you know, Tyler Toffoli was the first one that got moved, but Toffoli was the only one who got moved prior to the season. Michael Backlund was the only one who got signed prior to the season. So you got four key players, three of your best defensemen and your number one center who all didn't have contracts beyond this season. And so most of what his first season as general manager has been is just dealing with that and is trying to figure out if these guys are going to resign. And if not, then having to figure out what type of deals to make to move them out. And now, now that that's done and now that the, things that were put on his plate, the things that he inherited have been taken care of. I think Conroy can now start to build this team for two or three years down the road. Tommy, we're, uh, we're about a decade behind your great city in getting a building here. We're looking at the fall of 2027 for a replacement for the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. And I think honestly, what the Oilers, that, that, that model that the Oilers followed is, not saying it's, it's necessarily easy to do, and I don't think Calgary's getting a Connor McDavid or anything like that, but you know, one of the things that I look at is, as a massive success story for Ice District and Rogers Place is the Oilers were really good in year one in that building. They made the playoffs, and, and they had that run to the second round and almost made the Western Conference final. And so I think the Flames are looking at it like, hey, if we can have a good year when our new building opens in downtown Calgary, then – that's kind of the, the time frame they're looking at. So that's fall of 2027. It's spring of 2024. So that's kind of three seasons 
is what you're looking at in terms of how they want to build this. So they got yeah. multiple draft picks, multiple first round picks in the next three drafts. They've already acquired some young talent. They've had a couple of rookie standouts this year and they've got some capital to maybe use in trades. And so I think that's the blueprint right now is trying to build this team so that they're ready to compete at a much higher level come 2027, 20, 28 and, and see if they can stay there for four or five years or something like that. I think that's the, that's the plan, which makes, which makes this year's draft in Vegas where they've got two first round picks, their own and Vancouver's and, and they've got multiple first round picks in the following two years as well, makes it a pretty important next few off seasons for this team as they try to not fast track, but they try to make it so they can expedite uh, a little bit of a retool here as opposed to having it go five, six, seven years type thing. Yeah, that like let's not kid ourselves. The Oilers were incredibly fortuitous in winning that draft lottery. I'm never going to deny that for a second. And did they deserve it? Probably not after the, the years of inept inept uh, management and uh, some poor decision-making and, and all of that. But uh, they did get Carter McDavid. They did head into that 16-17 season in the new building with some steam, and uh, it, it did really kind of establish this uh, Oilers team that we're seeing today uh, seven years later. Pat Steinberg joining us from the Saddle Dome in Calgary. Patty, where is uh, the progress of the physical uh construction of this arena have they put a shovel into the ground have they have they started that process where where's that at right now so there's some piles of dirt um they have been doing for the last five six months so kind of at the set we, we've got two things happening at the same time uh in the city right now we've got them staging for the new event center so they're rerouting utilities and all that type of stuff it's making for just the most nightmarish time to get into the huh. saddle dome right now because they're building the new building adjacent to the saddle dome all the rerouting of utilities closing lanes and closing accesses and it just takes forever if you're coming in on a game day you need to add like 20 25 minutes oh. to get into the saddle dome these days so that's but they have yet to put a shovel in the ground uh, of the actual building that'll be after stampede and this area so the victoria park kind of east side of downtown area which is you know very similar to where where your downtown was where you know was in need of revitalization yes. and we all know what ice district has done for downtown edmonton and so the east side the victoria park east village area of calgary has been undergoing a lot of gentrification over the last decade and this is going to be a really huge part of it and at the same time they're also doing an lrt project kind of like a it's it's one of those potential city transforming LRT project that's going to run north to south and that's going in at the same time so they're they're definitely doing a lot of work there's a lot of uh, activity around where the new building is going to be but they're not going to actually put shovels in the ground until after stampede so we're looking August September for when the build for the new arena is actually going to start and they they think about a three-year build is is reasonable they feel mm -hmm. like that'll um you know, that, that'll accommodate for overruns, that'll accommodate for delays and all that type of stuff. So it, it sounds like a pretty attainable target is that fall of 2027, and maybe they're not ready to go for the preseason. I don't know, but it feels like that's kind of the target that we're looking at. So no shovels in the ground yet. There's definitely a lot going on around here. Hey, listen, the arena here, it was barely ready. It was basically still a construction site when they opened it up. Yeah. It, it takes time, and there's always different things, uh, unforeseen delays that can occur. So the more time, the better, certainly, and I'm sure they're going to get their stuff figured out down there. Um, now, how's the, the franchise, or not not the franchise, but the fan base dealing with where this franchise is at right now? Like, I'm sure that there are those who love and follow the Flames who are, are disheartened, but I'm sure there's some that have belief in Craig Conroy. Like, what's your read? Because you're dealing with it like we are here on the pre- and post-game show, night in, night out. Yeah, I think that there is, at, at worst, I think there's an understanding that what's going on was necessary. Like, when Johnny Gaudreau left, in the summer of 2022, uh, summer of 2023, rather, when when he left, and this team, I guess it would have been the summer of 2022. Yeah, it would have been after the right, after right. the Oilers series. So, so when Johnny Gaudreau left, it, it kind of set this team down a brand new path. And 
you know, the former general manager who's, who's now the GM in Toronto, Brad Living. you know, he took some big shots. He, he signed Nazem Kadri when Matthew Kachuk said that he wasn't going to re-sign long-term. They dealt him for Jonathan Huberto and Mackenzie Weger, and they signed both those guys to long-term deals. And, and it hasn't worked. You know, the, and, and that's not a knock on Kadri, who's been very, very good, especially this season. He's been dynamite for the Flames. Mm-hmm. But the idea of staying relevant, staying competitive, and, and trying to build on the success of the 21-22 season when they got to round two against the Oilers, you know, that, that hasn't worked. And so, and the players inside the locker room knew it hadn't worked, which is a big reason why Noah Hannafin and Chris Tanev and Elias Lindholm and, and these guys weren't as keen signing long-term with the team. And so the fans knew that the team couldn't just let these guys walk for nothing, like what happened with Johnny in the summer of 2022. So I think that, that at worst, I think there's an understanding that this needed to happen. I think on the, on the bright side, of the positive side, there's a lot of people who are excited about what the team is doing for the first time in a long, long time, Tom. This group is actually committing to a bigger picture and not just focusing on trying to stay competitive in the here and now. They're, they're actually willing to you know look down the road and, and think big picture. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they were just saying that. Like, I, I know there's always this, this push inside the room uh, to get to 500, but you know what's better, 500 now or or 25 games above 500 three years from now, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the way the organization is looking at it right now. And I think that a lot of fans are excited that they're willing to do that. Yeah, you have the you have lots who are like, man, I don't, I'm not really keen sitting through a rebuild, or I'm not, I don't like seeing my team lose and those types of things. But I think there's a general understanding that this had to happen, and the work that Craig Conroy has done so far, I think has, you know, bred some um, encouragement, positivity in, in Flames fans. Cause he's done a pretty good job so far and under tough circumstances, he absolutely nailed the Lindholm trade. He's gotten some significant first and second round picks. They've added some interesting prospects of the organization led by Hunter Brestevich of the Kitchener Rangers in the OHL who, you know, they're really, really excited about and what he could turn into at the NHL level. So, yeah, I think, I think for the most part, it's optimism, it's understanding. There's definitely some excitement in this market because I think more than anything, people knew that the path this team had walked over the last decade had just continually got them in the mushy middle and spending to the cap and trying to do everything to stay competitive in the here and now. What did it get them? It got them a couple playoff series wins. The playoff series went over Dallas and then a swift kicking out by the Edmonton Oilers. And, you know, prior to that, they had the, the series win over Vancouver in 2015. And again, we're out very quickly in round two. So it's not like this team has been to West Finals and Final Fours and has been knocking on the door for the Stanley Cup. And so doing something a little bit different, I think, has a lot of people energized. Rightly so, Patty. And I like that process and the mentality to get there. Um, all right. What are or who are some of the bright spots on this team that are going to give the Oilers uh, a tough go tonight? Is it as simple as saying, like a Connor Zary, who I know was a healthy scratch the other night, are there some some young pieces that we should watch out for from an Oilers standpoint when we're watching the Flames tonight? Well, from a uh, non-young standpoint, the game that Nazem Kadri had at Rogers Place on February 24th was just another one of the games where he's been yes. a tone setter for this team. He yes. has been so good for the Flames all year long. And I think if the Flames are going to pull off the upset, you wonder where the Oilers are going to be. Emotional win last night, and they clinched the playoff spot, and they're rolling into Calgary on the second half of back-to-back to face a non-playoff team. I think if the Oilers lose this game, I think you know there's probably some understanding as to what the circumstances are. I think that you might be okay if an Oilers fan yeah, it was probably a scheduled loss. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think that there's that, that kind of understanding that this might be a little bit of a letdown game. But I think Kadri's a guy to watch for always. Mm-hmm. He really gets fired up to play this Oilers team and, and really likes the challenge of playing some of the best players in the world on the other side. Zeri coming back after sitting one game as a healthy scratch is interesting. So Connor Zeri has been a revelation for the Flames. Their best rookie, no questions asked since... Uh, you know, you're everybody's favorite Matthew Kachuk when he broke into the league in 2016. They have not, they have not had a rookie make an impact like Derry has since Matthew. And he was out for eight games of injury, came back five games ago or six games ago now, 
and hasn't looked like the same guy. He's been mm-hmm. off the pace. He's been tentative. He hasn't been as as energetic, and he hasn't been as creative. So they sat him for one game and said, hey, we just want to give you that reset. They want you to come in for the final six games and, and really show us that guy that was so dynamic prior. So Zeri's one to watch. And don't forget about Martin Pospisil. Right. He just avoided a suspension for a questionable hit on Winnipeg's Josh Morrissey on Thursday. He was suspended about a month ago. He's got three majors slash ejections since the All-Star break. He plays on the edge. They like how he plays on the edge, but they also love the pace that he plays with, the forecheck, and how he uh, he really helps this team get to their game and get to their identity. So I'm curious what Postasil's got up his sleeve in a rivalry game tonight. And the final guy to keep an eye on, I'm really curious about Andre Kuzmenko. He's right. got points in uh, his last four games, seven in his last four. He's been shooting it. He's been dynamic. He's given their power play a boost. They haven't. They've had a horrible power play all year long, only until recently when Kuzmenko has finally gotten over a back injury and finally gotten over an illness where you're like, oh, maybe that looks a little bit more like the guy who scored 39 with Vancouver last year. So we're finally seeing Kuzmenko look like something that could help this team. I'm, I'm really excited to watch him in this game tonight, too. And, and I wonder, you know, we don't know if he's going to be a long-term flame or not, but he can make a pretty, pretty good bet he's going to be a flame to start next season. And so, yeah, I keep an eye on Kuzmenko if you're the Oilers tonight as well. I like that return in the Lindholm deal. Hey, Patty, uh, before we went to air, I, I was talking to YouTube Trev, our producer on the pre- and post-game show, who grew up in Pincher Creek. He's like, man, Pat Steinberg. I used to listen to him all the time when I was living in Pincher Creek. And I was like, well, now I'm your hero, YouTube Trev. So uh, I've taken the mantle from you. And uh, he's had two great mentors in the sports broadcasting game. I just want you to know that, Patrick. I am fine if I've been replaced by you. If there's anybody to ever replace me, I couldn't choose a better human than Tom Gazzola. Oh, you are a gentleman and a scholar and uh, still one of uh, young YouTube Trev's heroes. Thanks, Patty, for the time today. Have a great pre- and post-game show, my friend. Thank you, Tommy. We'll talk soon, buddy. All right. That is Pat Steinberg from 960 The Fan Sportsnet Radio in Calgary. A very, very good friend of mine and Dusty's and a hero to YouTube, Trev. Just get get on here. I know I'm just bugging you and busting your job. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good, Tommy. But you were saying, like, you listen to Pat all the time, right? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know him, but I feel like I do now just you because do. You guys uh, are best friends now. When I was in when I was in college, uh, even before college, I was always tuning in. Uh, like it's always nice to. I, I like watching you know Oilers related content, but um, it's always fun. I love hearing what Flames fans have to say about their team, and uh, maybe it's because I'm a little bit of a brat, and it would put a smile on my face, especially if they have a tough loss. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure a lot of Oilers fans do that. I'm not the only one, but uh, yeah, it, it's pretty cool. Um, when I went to, I, I tried try to go to at least one Battle of Alberta at the Dome a year. Uh, sometimes I'd go to all of them, but usually one. And uh, driving home, it was it was always fun listening to hear what he has to say. He's he's super. He's too, he's so good, man. He's like awesome. he's he's he does a really good job at uh, you know just easing, you know, calming everyone down, calming kind of like what we do with uh, the Oilers crowd. So we try it's uh, yeah we try we give it a go. So yeah. it's pretty cool. But yeah, Patty, he's uh, he's an all timer, so it's pretty cool. A great. Great broadcaster, even better human being, and I uh, can't thank Patty enough for hopping on the pregame show. I wasn't sure we are going to be able to get him because he's got a, he goes on at 7. And I was like, you know what? We're going an hour and a half, Pat, so let's get you on right away. So it's 6.35 today, and I'm so glad we did. And he tells you how it is, too. He doesn't mess around. He kind of he gives it to you straight up. So Patty's just uh, fantastic. So there you go, YouTube, Jeff. It's now, pretty sweet. Now, now you have his phone number. You I have his phone number. I'm going to be like, hey, man. How's him. it going? Hey, Pat, it's YouTube Trap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could do that if you want. I don't care. It's all good. Uh, 780-218-9999. Text us as we get you set for the last Battle of Alberta in 23-24. And I will also add the portions of this hour brought to you by our good friends at 100.3 The Bear, Edmonton's best rock catch, Dusty on with Uke and McCord. Weekday mornings, and then tune into Jess Jackson on your drive home from work every single weekday. So 100.3 The Bear, our good friends. Uh, great to be partnering up with them. Uh, all right, Tube Socks. I saw Tube Socks texting. I like it. Uh, hello, Tube Socks. Good day, Stephen. 
Tube Sock says, it must feel strange doing the pregame in the studio. Yeah, kind of. Because the last two, I was at West Summit Mall, Hudson's, and last night I was at what? You would have loved yesterday, by the way. I believe it. You would have had a time. There were young, single girls frolicking about right in your wheelhouse. Oh, no. I was just like, if Trev were only here. I get, uh, yeah, there's always another time, but, uh, I definitely, I'll definitely, well, the first time I went to White Ave, man, I was, I was blown away. It was like, you know, like I said, I'm from a small town, so it was, I I couldn't get over all the people there and I'm like, well, I, and that's, it kind of, it was my first day in Edmonton. Yeah. Uh, I was like, wow, I'm falling in love with this place already. And, uh, I hadn't even gone downtown or anything. My first place was White Ave and just seeing all these people, there's all these cars. I I couldn't get over it. So it was pretty cool. But yes, the, the Hudson's on white it's a cool place i will definitely be uh maybe we'll get zach to come to to hold down the four one of these days so i can make it down to one of them but uh yeah i'd yeah, like that I think i'd it'd like be that. great I'd have, I'd have you on co-hosting if, if you did oh that. that'd be cool yeah well that's, let's get on it oh that's, that's, that's a fun way to do it i'll call zach now uh, yes we we have a couple more dates the next one is april 10th that's when we're on location again uh that one is going to be the west edmonton mall bourbon street uh hudson's and then we have our last watch party, listener watch party of the regular season. We'll, we'll find out what we're doing for the postseason, but uh, we know on the 18th, the last game of the year, the Oilers are in Colorado, and we're going to be doing our last listener slash watch party at the Hudson's on White Avenue. VR Montenegro, who was with us yesterday, as well as Norman Combine, his wife Tracy, and uh, Richard, uh, VR Montenegro says, lots of ladies for YTT. Woo. Yep, definitely true. Mike uh, and I were like, whoa, this place is hopping. So it was really, really good. All right, uh, we are going to get to cast in about seven minutes' time. We will have some fresh audio from Chris Knobloch, who spoke about 15 minutes ago. We'll get that to you. When we gather it up, but let's go inside the Flames dressing room first. What do you say? Are we ready to do that? Yeah, yeah we, we could go to Ryan Huska. Let's do it. All right, sounds good. Here is Flames head coach Ryan Huska from earlier today. The update on uh, Michael Backlund. Um, Michael will be a game time decision tonight. Well, just hypothetically, who might slide in the middle if Backlund's not able to go? Uh, we have a few different options. So my gut says he will, but um, um, there's different people that we can use in there for sure. Like there's Marty, there's Connor. Um, we have different options. Is Manjapani still on the shelf, or is he in tonight? Uh, Manji will not play tonight. Yeah. When it comes to Connor, you said yesterday that you don't want rookies sort of being gift wrapped ice time. What's the danger if, if you do guarantee that ice time to, to rookies? How can that uh, snowball? If, if uh, the danger if you just it, give? Yeah, yeah. Um, guys don't have to work for anything, and they become complacent. And they feel like everything is just, well, I should be in this position. Uh, and in regards to rookies, we don't. I don't look at Connor as a rookie. He's been here all year. So Connor is a, he's an important piece of our team, um, and I think he's going to be one of our better players on the ice tonight. And where are you hoping to see him tonight? The, like I mentioned yesterday, the way he – What I would love to see is that energy and fire that we saw when he got his first call up. Now, I know that's hard to replicate because that's something that's once in a lifetime. But um, when he's got that drive about him where he wants the puck, where he wants to control the play, he's a really good player. We asked you earlier in the week about Dennis Gilbert, and you praised the the work ethic he's had while being out. Looks like he might get back into it. What do you want to see from him? Sometimes that's a tough job to have, and we've had some guys here that are good examples of how to do it the right way. Michael Stone always comes to my mind that every time he was called upon in a situation like this, he was ready to play because that's responsibility that comes with it. So for him, it's it's bringing his best game, and, and when he does play his best game, he moves the puck quick, uh, and he's a physical player. So that's what we'll look for out of him tonight. Have you had a little chat with Pospisil about his latest game? Um, yeah, I have talks with Marty all the time. I mean... Like I said to you yesterday, you don't want to change a player like that at all. I mean, you want to get him to understand the line and not over it. And that's really what it comes down to. And a lot of that comes from maturity. And um, he, he has a good handle on on how he needs to be. And hits are always going to be a part of his game. They need to be because that's what separates him from a lot of players in the NHL right now. It's just a matter of making sure um, 
he's doing it the right way. Because the biggest thing for me is I don't want him in the penalty box and I don't want him to miss games um, due to a suspension of some type. So just make sure he does it the right way. When you look at that one play, and obviously the league's deemed that it was it was okay, Yeah. what could he have done differently? Um, so how do you talk about that with him in terms of being done differently? Well, I, I think the, the one thing you have to recognize sometimes where – uh, your opponent is in maybe a vulnerable position. So then you maybe don't finish the hit at that situation and you save it for another time when he's not. Up until that hit, did you get the sense that Marty was getting the message about not stepping over the line? I still think he's getting the message. You know, I mean, you look at the score sheet all, after almost every game and he's five, six, nine, ten hits a night. That's who he is. Um, and up until that um, game in Winnipeg, there's been nothing of question. Right, but he's still finishing his hits. He's still playing hard, and he's going to have to continue to do that. Can I just ask you about? I remember years ago there. Were, uh, I can't remember which player, but he he said he wanted to have five hits a night all year long, and the argument was you can't sustain that. Is that sustainable in today's NHL? A guy getting seven to ten hits a night? Um, you know, probably not. I mean, but I think that's where it comes from maturity, um, where he'll understand where there's certain situations and certain times that um, to start a game, I need to be the guy that's setting the tone for how the game's going to be played. Um, so as you grow up and, and learn the game and learn situations more, um, it, it could come down a little bit. But he's not gonna, he's not ever gonna be a guy that's not gonna finish his hits. It's not in him. That's just the way he's been from a young young guy to where he is now. Do you, do you kind of um, the role of spoiler? Like, is that something you use sometimes? To uh, nope. Uh, we we're talking about our team, how we have to play, and we have a battle of Alberta tonight, and it's one of the more exciting games that our guys get an opportunity to play, and so we're, we're excited to go for this one. Is it pretty easy to say you just replicate what you did in Edmonton a few weeks ago? Uh, there was a lot of things that we did well there, um, and we'd like to see uh, a lot of those things in tonight's game for sure. You're seeing right now, uh, Ryan, with your, your forward lines and sort of the offensive opportunities they've been able to generate, or, or maybe is there a little bit more left there for, for some of the I know you got some yeah. big contributions from that cadre line, but um, just the rest of them. I, I think there's more from the rest of them right now, whether it's finishing chances or generating more. I mean, if you look at our last – three, four, or five games, it's it's one line that's been fairly significant in our chance report. Um, so they've been around it a fair bit. We need other lines to do the same thing because that's when we're at our best and when we give ourselves chances to win. All right, that was Calgary Flames head coach Ryan Huska as his team gets set to face the Edmonton Oilers for the final time this season. Yes, indeed, the Flames uh, got the better of the Oilers in a tough one. Actually, Edmonton didn't play particularly great in that 6-3 loss here in Edmonton back on February 24th. The Flames did take it to the Oilers and uh, it was one of those uh, little smacks upside the head wake-up call, if you will, for the Oilers and they uh, I think for the most part got the message and start to rattle off uh, a few wins after that one. So we'll see what happens tonight. They don't want to play spoiler uh, but they do want to give the Oilers uh, a run for their money and give Flames fans something to cheer about as uh, the Flames wind down the season. All right, before we get to Cass, uh, we will go through the anticipated starting lineups for the Oilers. This is what they went with yesterday. So we saw McDavid with Drysdale and Hyman, Nugent Hopkins with Henrique and Fogel, McLeod between Kane and Perry, that line had a good night. And then uh, Ryan was with Yanmark and Brown. I, I anticipate maybe Carrick gets in. I, I'm not so sure if Stetra does, but we'll see. Now that the Orders have clinched a playoff spot, are playing their final seven games. It is a back-to-back. -back. They did travel to Calgary. It is a 25-minute flight on the... The old Oilers charter, but maybe they get some fresh legs in there because uh, Ekholm was with Bouchard yesterday. Ekholm, an absolute beast yesterday in that game. He was the Damon Bunting Remax Elite player of the game. Nurse with CC Kulak with Dayarnay, and when the teams hit the ice for a warm up at the Saddle Dome, we will let you know if there are any changes. A bit of ambiguity for the Flames during their morning skate. So these are anticipated. Lines and D pairings. Nazem Kadri between Martin Pospisil and Andre Kuzmenko, who you heard Pat Steinberg say he's starting to play much better. Kadri's been good. Uh, on the second line, Yegor Sharangovich between Jonathan Uberdo and Dryden Hunt. 
Michael Backlund between Matt Coronado and Blake Coleman. And then Kevin Rooney centering Connor Zeri, who was a healthy scratch last game for the Flames. And Walker Dewar on defense for Calgary. Mackenzie Weger with Daniel Marimanov. Oliver Shillington with Rasmus Anderson. Then Dennis Gilbert with Braden Pahal. Uh, that would mean no Joel Hanley, who's day-to-day undisclosed. Andrew Mangiapane, day-to-day undisclosed. Dan Vladar, day-to-day hip. And then no Akita Okuchuk for Calgary. Starting goalies, anticipating 31-year-old Calvin Pickard getting the nod. 11-6 and six this season, 240 goals against average, 9-11 save percentage, one shutout, 19 games for the veteran netminder. Lifetime versus Calgary Pickard, an 0-4 record, 386 goals against average, 879 save percentage, and five appearances versus the Flames. At the other end of the rink, 34-year-old Jacob Markstrom, Getting the nod, 23-20-2 is his record. 274 goals against average. 906 save percentage with two shutouts in 45 games this season. Markstrom, who's been in the Pacific Division forever, has a 15-16-2 record against Edmonton Lifetime with a 299 GAA, 900 save percentage, one shutout in 33 career games versus the oil all right those are your anticipated starting lineups we will update them when the teams hit the ice for warm-up text us your thoughts 780-218-9999 as well as the nasty chat if you're watching on our youtube channel Todd gazola youtube trev with you maddie Cassian coming along shortly i'll throw out the question of the night as well let me know your thoughts I'm just I'm, I'm curious. When I was coming up with a uh, curious, I was talking to YouTube Trev. We we're getting ready to hop on. I was like, you know what? Like we've done like player specific. We've done situation specific. How about this one? A little broader scope. Which NHL rivalry is better than the Battle of Alberta and why? And I know that might be sacrilege to say that. But if you take a step back, big picture, which NHL rivalry is better than the Battle of Alberta, and why? Is it Detroit, Colorado, like it was early 2000s, late 90s? Is it maybe the Battle of Ontario, Ottawa, and Toronto? Is it the classic Leafs-Habs, like we're witnessing tonight? Maybe it's Habs-Bruins. Maybe it's uh, the Rangers and the Devils, like we saw the other night with the line brawl. Is it the Rangers and the Islanders? Is it the Islanders? Ah, no, not, not, not the Islanders and the Devils. Are there better rivalries than the Battle of Alberta, or is there one specific rivalry, in your opinion, that is better than the Battle of Alberta, and why? Let us know your thoughts. 780-218-9999. And, of course, get into the nasty chat. Taylor from Indiana says the Toronto-Montreal rivalry is better. Uh, T. Willison says... Torts versus the entire NHL. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sean Bell today on Hello Hockey really tried to get me going with the Tortorella stuff. And uh, I just couldn't. I couldn't allow myself to get into it. So uh, I, I will not go there, T. Willison. I like it. Uh, Charlie, Charlie, who has a Jets logo in his uh, Twitter not Twitter, but YouTube handle says rivalry. Jets wild. Uh, is this towards me? Oh no. Okay. I, I, there's some. There's some. Some back and forth in the nasty chat between some viewers. Be nice, everybody. Be nice. Everybody love everybody. It's Saturday. It's spring. The sun just came out for the first time today, and we've got the Battle of Alberta going on tonight, which is absolutely tremendous. Last one of the season. Oilers looking to make it 3-1 and one versus the Flames. This season started with the Heritage Classic. That was a great night. Honestly, just a fantastic event. Perfect day in the city. The Oilers won that one in those really nice uniforms. No, they will not wear them again. And no, they will never again wear those uh, navy and orange ones. Those ones are toast. So it's going to be the orange and blue for the rest of the year. Don't cry. What are you sad? What's wrong with you? I'm not sad, but you I gave love... me this sad look. Yeah, I'm sad. That that sucks. Those were awesome. They sucked. You didn't like them? No. You don't like like the five year old designed them. What is, so? What about like the Dallas like that we saw the other night? Those like, are the, awesome. Those two tone, but uh, but not for the Oilers. No, they copied the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, 
I like them. I think they're crisp. All right. Well, I like the re- reverse retro last year. I like the reverse retro before that. I like the Heritage Classic jerseys. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. What rivalry in the NHL is better than the Battle of Alberta? Let me know why. 780-218-9999. And, of course, in the nasty chat, Johnny Alberta. What's up, Johnny Alberta? Says nothing's better than Oilers than Flames. But Canadians Nordiques was definitely second place. I like it. Keep those coming in. I'll read them out as we move along. Our boy, Matt Cassian. Looks like he's ready to rock and or roll. Let's get him on here. Where is he at? There he is. What's up, Cass? How you doing, pal? I'm good. It was uh, it was birthday Saturday today. Uh, Ooh. Not any of my kids' birthdays, but apparently a lot of kids had birthdays either this week or this weekend. So a lot of a lot of taxi driving today in the oh. Cassian family. But uh, but we're good. We are good, Tom. Little Battle of Alberta. Nothing wrong with it, even though the Flames are uh, out of the playoff picture. So it. Uh, it should be an exciting one. They're always exciting, Tom, as you've already mentioned. Yes, they absolutely are. All right, 780-218-9999, as well as a nasty chat if you want to answer the question of the night or you want to ask something uh, to Cass, uh, fire those our way. We want to hear from you. And uh, question of the night one more time, is there or it, what rivalry is better than the Battle of Alberta, in your op- opinion? Cass, you were part of the Battle of Ontario, and I know how much you hated the Toronto Maple Leafs as a member of the Sens. Yeah. Is there a rivalry in the NHL that you think might be better than the Battle of Alberta? It, I don't think so. There's some really good rivalries. And there's there's some that are fun to watch. I don't think anything quite hits like the Battle of Alberta. And I think just because of the, the history between the two teams, um, especially in the 80s, like it, there's just there's so much meat to it. Yeah. That it just It's really tough to beat. Now, now some of the rivalries are, are fun. Like New York, New Jersey, that's a pretty fun rivalry. Yeah. Um, you know, you could even say like Boston, Toronto, that's a fun rivalry. True. Really, really great. Um, all the all the Ontario teams, those are all good rivalries. Like like Ottawa, Montreal is actually surprisingly, I mean, that's that's a really good rivalry. Um, Toronto, Ottawa too, Toronto, Montreal. Like they, there's some of the Canadian rivalries that are really, really good, but nothing, Tom, I think quite has the same feel to it as the Battle of Alberta. I just, I don't yep. think there's anything else out there like that, at least not in hockey. One that kind of flies under the radar that I really enjoy watching because there's a legitimate nastiness to it, and they're two really good teams right now, is the Battle of Florida. Like, yeah. the Lightning and the Panthers, I think, is a great rivalry, and I but, like but when I they think, go toe-to-toe. But I think that's more now-dependent because they're two really good teams right now. Fair. Like That's fair. You know, so it's like, okay, current, yeah, it's really fun to watch those two teams play because they're two good teams. But when Florida was horrible and Tampa was really good, yeah, it wasn't that fun. Yeah, it, it didn't matter. Like, you wouldn't have the same oomph to it where it's like even if one of the teams between Edmonton and Calgary isn't very good, it still has some meat to the to the series and the storyline. So, um, yeah, again, there's there's a lot of good rivalries, a lot of fun ones to watch, a lot of good teams when they play each other in their close proximity. It's it can be really fun, but I just don't think anything quite hits the level of the Battle of Alberta. Tell me. Love it. Uh, question of the night one more time. Which NHL rivalry is better than the Battle of Alberta and why? And, hey, maybe it's not true. There is no better rivalry. You could tell us. That's okay. I'm listening. I just want to hear from you. 780-218-9999. And, of course, via our YouTube channel in the Nasty Chat. Uh, All right, let's go to Game Changers with Matty Cassian. Brought to you, as always, by Damon Bunting, REMAX Elite. Damon Bunting, consistent, top-producing realtor in Greater Edmonton and among Western Canadian REMAX realtors. He and his team would love to help you find that right home. Or make the move from your current home. He's community-driven, understands what it takes to make a difference in our city. So check him out, DamonBunting.com, or visit his Instagram at Damon Bunting Real Estate. Great guy. Absolutely tremendous. And uh, Cass and I know him very, very well. All right, Cass, let's go to number one. No exhale. I like it. Nope, no exhale needed. Uh, hopefully they got all their um, pats on the back out of their way before the post-game interviews were done yesterday. Mm-hmm. And they just settled themselves in and uh, have been preparing for this game tonight. And the, and the natural tendency after a huge game like they just won against the Colorado Avalanche can be to just kind of sit in your laurels and be content. Um, fortunately, it's a Calgary Flames 
Fortunately, I think that brings the best out in Edmonton, but they really can't uh, afford to have an exhale. For as much as Calgary has struggled recently, for as many players as Calgary traded away, you know, those guys in that room still want to win, yep. still have a desire to play well. Um, and they're going to throw what they have at Edmonton because they nobody want to lose to Edmonton at home. Not when you're the Calgary Flames playing in Calgary. Uh, you really want to put on a good show for your fans. So the Edmonton Oilers tonight, Tommy, better not uh, not be taking any of uh, those just comfy sighs of contentment from eating, uh, eating too much of the Colorado Avalanche's dinner last night. Hey, they played really good against the Avs, and we gave them all the praise in the world for the way they bounced back. Last mm -hmm. night, Cass, have you ever in your time in the National Hockey League, were you on a team that was a spoiler at the end of the season? The Flames have oh, six yeah. games left. <laughs> uh, what is that like? Because you want to believe from an outsider's perspective and as, uh, obviously a fan's perspective that the team you root for, even though it's out of playoff contention and eliminated and all of that, is is wanting to beat the living snot out of every team it faces. Yeah. But what's that like as a player in mop-up duty in the NHL? Well, for me, it was always different. I think it's different for some of your top end guys because they're kind of like, you know, get me my cookies and let's get on with it. Right. Like get, get a point, get to, you know, pad the stats and just don't get hurt. Right. Um, where for some of those guys, I think there is a tendency to, you know, step off the gas a little bit unless there's a real opportunity to score a goal. For guys in my position, guys trying to fight for a spot in the lineup in the future, everything is still on the line every single night. You know, if you're a guy that doesn't have a six year contract at like 8 million plus, Guess what? You have something to prove. Uh, anyone that's on an expiring deal on an RFA deal or or is going to be heading into the last year of their deal, you, uh, you're trying to hold on to your job and your spot in the lineup. You're trying to get those minutes. And so you still have, I don't want to say every motivation, but every motivation outside of, you know, we have the opportunity to win a Stanley Cup. Like you are, you're still playing for everything. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, where teams do end up playing spoiler is, there's always something on the line, even if it's not the Stanley Cup. There is always something on the line for a majority of guys in that dressing room. And so everyone still tries to put in the same amount of work because, Tommy, everyone wants to have a job next year. And if you skunk it out at the end of the season, again, unless you're one of the top end guys, you're, you're setting yourself up for a tougher training camp and a tougher you know, job of trying to make the team the next year. Right. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So number one, no exhale and uh, expect to see a spunky flames bunch because yeah, those guys that uh, maybe are on the cusp or need a contract next year want to make a statement and the spotlight's probably not going to get much bigger than this game for the rest of the season for those Calgary flames. All right, cast number two, Uyghurlicious. Ooh, Uyghurlicious, Mackenzie Uyghur having a heck of a season for a yes, Calgary team that has struggled in a lot of ways. Um, you could quite put up twenty here as a, as a defenseman, which is which is pretty uh, which is pretty crazy. Now yeah. now Evan Bouchard is close. He's yeah. close, but Evan Bouchard is playing on a power play with uh, Leon Drysaddle and Connor McDavid. That's one mm -hmm. of the best power plays in the league. The Calgary Flames power play has been just atrocious for a, a vast portion of the season. Uh, yet Mackenzie Weger finds ways to put the puck in the net to score both on the power play as well as five on five. Just very, very, um, I don't, I don't want to just say very talented defenseman, but extremely well-rounded, like mm -hmm. plays offense. Well, plays defense. Well, skates. Well, has he uh, had a couple bounces this year? For sure. There's been a couple fortuitous bounces that have helped him get to that 19 goal mark. But Tommy, I mean, he's, he's a guy which, if we're looking at the Calgary Flames and saying, okay, where does their offense run through? A lot of it runs through Mackenzie Weger. And we've seen this just the other day against the Edmonton Oilers where, yeah, he jumps into the rush. And you have to be aware of where he is on the ice. Uh, you have to know that he is going to be sniffing around and looking for opportunities to to get in there, to end up in front of your net and to put the puck home. Um, Edmonton has to be aware of this. Your mm -hmm. forwards have to be aware of it. You can't you can't get so puck focused that you're not thinking about a defenseman that could be jumping into the rush or sneaking down on you. Um, you know, you, you need to be shoulder checking all the time, um, even if you aren't sure or if you know um, what. Well, if you know he's on the ice, you need to be. If you're unsure if he's on the ice, you need to be. And really, Tom, just a, a high level of focus on those defensemen trying to sneak in uh, just because of Mackenzie Weger against the Calgary Flames, I would say, is paramount tonight. Mackenzie Weger through 75 games, 19 goals, 29 assists, cast 48 points, plus two, 47 penalty minutes. 
pretty good season on a team that has not overall had a good year as the Flames look to wind things down in 2023-2024. It is Game Changers with our game analyst, Matt Cassian, brought to you as always by Damon Bunting, Remax Elite, number one, no exhale. Number two, you just heard it, Uyghurlicious. Number three, cast, cast shift management. Back-to-back games, Tommy. We talk about this often uh, with back-to-back games, but it is important. You don't want to get caught out there for too long. You want to make sure you have uh, short shifts. You want to make sure you uh, allow yourself ample time um, to recover in between shifts. I mean, that shift management is important. And and not just for the game tonight, Tommy, but starting to head down the stretch into playoffs. Yeah. And if you start to try to extend shifts here, I think you, you, know, you, you have some vulnerability in the game as far as, um, you know, being able to produce and, and playing well an old Kevin Constantine statistic. And I have no idea if this still holds up or if it even was accurate, but it sounds right. So I'm going to say it, um, was that, uh, you, you know, you have about a 10% chance, like you, you decrease, like if you look at hundred percent of your goals, 10% come after 30 seconds of that. So for every 10 goals you score, only one comes after you've been on the ice for 30 seconds and you're, a percentage of being scored on is basically the opposite of that, where it's like 90% of the goals you give up are after 30 seconds in your shift. So again, okay. I don't know if that's still accurate, but r- really the the probability and the likelihood of you scoring a goal once you pass that 30 second mark drops significantly and the potential for you to get score on starts to statistically go up quite significantly. So it's um, you know Im- important that when you're playing these back-to-back games, I would assume, and again, this is just me, assuming without any hard statistical data behind it, but I think it's a fair and logical and reasonable assumption is that when you're in back to backs, I think that's probably even magnified by a couple Mm -hmm. of seconds where when you have played and not like it was a crazy amount of travel, but when you have played two games in a row that, uh, you know, your, your shifts should get compressed a little bit because that statistic would probably compress a little bit in those situations. So really important that when you are, uh, um, you know, playing these back to backs that you are just, you're managing your changes. You're managing, not getting stuck out there. You're not trying to extend shifts. And this applies, I think, even to the Edmonton Oilers and their power play as well, where it's like, okay, back to back nights, you know, you start getting to that minute and 25 minute and 20 seconds on the power play. Mm -hmm. Um, It's time to start to think about changing maybe a little bit earlier than you would if this was, you know, you you didn't play yesterday or you had a day off or whatever the case may be. Um, So there's that game, you know, I, I guess, mindset to it but then just a a long term mindset for the rest of the season heading into playoffs is you want to manage your energy levels too now you want to play as well as you can you want to build all kinds of crazy momentum and play consistent um really good playoff hockey all the way through uh, but you know you don't want to get hurt and you still need to be smart about what you're doing and the uh, same thing you know probably less likely that if you're fresh to put yourself in a vulnerable position. So um, make sure you're watching those shifts link shift links uh, for Knobloch. It's going to be managing that as well on the bench, uh, doing a good job of uh, reading his players, reading the game flow, reading the momentum and knowing when to pull guys, uh, when not to, and making sure that that bench and shift management is all under control. Really good point about shift management. I want to extend that a little bit here. The orders have seven games remaining cast. And they now have that playoff spot, spot clinched. Um, I've, I've seen some texts say, hey, maybe they can uh, you know, rest McDavid, rest Dreisaitl, make sure that other guys can get in, this and that. I understand that rationale. I don't feel like it's going to happen. Are there methods to rest guys even with them playing yeah, the majority you just play of the them less of minutes. Games. Yeah, you play him less minutes. You're not going to not play them. Connor McDavid wants to win the Art Ross, and I know he doesn't care about winning the individual awards. He wants to win a Stanley Cup. Yeah, but he cares about winning the individual awards. He like does. if you said, "Hey, if you could choose, do you want to win it or do you not want to win it?" He wants to win it. He wants to win it. Yeah. So you're not going to scratch these guys, right? You're not going to not dress them. Um, and even then, you you want them you want them to be game ready and that they've been playing hockey games and they're not rusty heading into the playoffs. However, you don't want to overextend them and tire them out and fatigue them more than you need to. So it it becomes, again, you you maybe lean in a game like a game today against Calgary back to back. You lean maybe a little bit more on your third and fourth lines to pick up some of the slack. So you're, you know, you're cutting from 23 minutes to 20 minutes or to 19 Mm -hmm. minutes or to, you know, if you have a game in hand, 
um, in, or under control where you're up a couple. Well, now you're going to dial that back even more to where they're playing 15, 16, 17 minutes a night. Like that's that's the type of um, shift management and and energy management you most likely are going to see more than the outright we're just going to completely scratch this player. Right. Maybe it happens if a guy is a little nicked up and he's like, uh, you know, I do have this or that that's bugging me. Maybe that does happen, but sure. if, if that's not the case, Tommy, you're going to see him still play, just play more controlled minutes. Tom Gazzola, Matt Cassian, YouTube Trev with you. It is the Oil Stream pregame show as uh, we get you set for the final Battle of Alberta of the 2023-2024 season. Uh, text us, 780-218-9999. Get into the nasty chat as well. Question of the night is this. Uh, is there or what rivalry is better than the Battle of Alberta and why keep those texts coming in let's go into the inbox cast a couple of funny ones here mike texts in and says it's my birthday today and i had a lot too much fun last night at the game i bumped into the one and only bob stoffer as well starting to recover now just in time for the game go oil go tommy thank you mike happy birthday mike from all of us here you want to wish him a happy birthday there cast oh look at that he muted himself <laughs> you're still Maybe muted oh there you are oh my see, i don't know see here's the thing is i didn't hit the mute button so i'm not sure we why didn't. i'm not saying you did i'm saying the thing this actually is done i'm gonna say the system has done some weird things because it's done weird things with my yeah, microphone yeah, yeah. too so i'm just okay. gonna blame the computer blame okay. the computer okay. you know what it is what? you know what it is it's big brother they're watching yeah they're watching and they didn't like what i was gonna say they didn't Perfect. they didn't want me to say happy birthday uh, happy birthday to Mike from all of happy us Happy birthday, Mike. There we go. Uh, have fun tonight, uh, mixing the water, all that good stuff. And glad to know that you've recovered from your fun time last night. Let's go to the rookie who texted in and said, hey, Columbus, Anaheim. Just kidding. I love watching Boston destroy the Leafs, but it's still second to the Battle of Alberta. So there you go. Cass, you brought up the Leafs in Boston. That's a good one. Uh, Corey B., who is going to get an EST tattoo which is crazy we're working on that um uh, cory b says uh hey tommy do you happen to know if we're going to get a mitchell and ness morrow jersey i'd love to upgrade my og jersey thanks also i think it has to be the habs versus bruins just been a classic for a hundred years now yes the bruins celebrating 100 years i don't know about the mitchell and ness morrow jersey i, I I don't know which player specifically, but it looks like they're dropping them relatively um, quickly in terms of which ones they're, they're putting out. If you could buy a, any classic jersey cast, like if like defunct jerseys, defunct teams, what would you get? Ooh, Golden Seals would be pretty good. I think Dave Jameson has one of those. Yeah, I think he's got one. That would be pretty yeah. sweet. Um. The the New York Islanders highliner would be all right. That's a good one. I have a Jason Strudwick reverse retro of that that I got yeah, last year. Yeah, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, one I've had on my list that I need to get at some point that I want is the the Oilers spawn jersey for like a fifty five Ulanov. Um, <laughs> that to me is just like I want that. Uh, that would be one that's up there for me just personally. That I'm like, this would be sweet. I would love that thing and rock it all the time. Um. What other ones would be really good? Um, like a Minnesota North Stars or like... Minnesota North Stars is pretty sweet. Those ones yeah. are cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like those ones. Uh, I, I kind of feel like at some point the Atlanta Thrashers one will be kind of like... Ah, uh, yes. Further out we get from that, that'll be one that's kind of you know pretty, pretty retro and kind of cool. Um, I do like I... I mean, it is hard to argue the old Mighty Ducks, like the Mighty Ducks ones. Classic, before yes. Before there was just Ducks, like the classic Mighty Ducks ones. Those are pretty sweet, too. Like having a, a classic Mighty Ducks Korea, that's that'd be pretty That'd be pretty cool. I I'd love one of those, that. too. Yeah. I respect that very, very much. Um, Belzy said the year he played with the Habs, got called up for a couple of games. They had, I think it was their 100th year, and they had like six different uniforms, and he had the barbershop one. Mm. That uh, he was, he, he got scratched that game, but they had one ready to go. And I don't know if he said he got to keep it or not, but that would be a cool one. Like That's those, a cool one, too. Yeah, those one offs. Um, I just went over because Corey B asked about the McFarlane original, and it looks like I, Ice District Authentics uh, put out a teaser a few days ago on the third. 
Uh, it looks like on the 9th, they will be unveiling their next set of Mitchell and Ness um, throwback jerseys. One is from 0506 because they have the Western Conference Stanley Cup patch uh, on it. And then it's the Navy one, as well as the original McFarlane jersey, not the reverse retro that we saw last year. I don't know, Cass, if Ulanov's on the back of that one. So that's how they're doing it. They're putting a specific yep. player, limited run of each. But it's a really neat concept, and I like the fact that they're doing this. Hey, you know what, Cass? When you played mini, that's one of the things I admire about the Wild is uh, in the team store, they had every single player's uniform that yep. you could buy, not just like five or six different guys. And they, they had, had they had every single every single player had a T-shirt rack yeah. where you could uh, – I, I don't know if it was all jerseys. Like I don't know if they had every single jersey. I saw had, every jer- – I saw your they may jersey. Have had, they may be. Yeah, they may have had yeah. everyone. Yeah. Um, and I know they have would have T-shirts for everybody, so it was like ev- everyone could have one. It was it was pretty nice. That was yeah. it, it's actually we're talking about team stores. The 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 lodge there is actually pretty pretty good. Like if it you're a Minnesota Wild fan, it's a it's a good shop. Like there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, yeah, uh, really neat. And when teams do it right, it looks like uh, the the Oilers marketing team is getting it uh, getting it right for sure. Uh, it's it's something that's. Uh, enjoyed and appreciated by the fan base all right Cass uh any final thoughts from you as we head into this final BOA of the regular season I mean I just wanted to stop on the flames that would just ah. make me feel happy bring me much joy and happiness Tommy to see the Edmonton Oilers just stomp on them and really I want to see that too just from a momentum standpoint like not taking that step back of just you know, ideally they're laser beam focused here on out down the stretch. Um, how nice would it be to carry a, a nice winning streak into the playoffs? I mean, that'd be yes. fantastic. Yes. Uh, so I want to see him build on that game against Colorado because it was a good game. Now they're the team that's playing a back to back. Now Calgary isn't as good as Edmonton is, you know, from, yeah. from a Colorado having to go to the back 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 to back situation. But uh, yeah, Tommy, I just want to see him. I want to see positive momentum. That's what I want to see tonight. Go in there, have a game. Happy Oilers fans who apparently are going to be uh, in droves down at the Saddle Dome, and uh, we can all enjoy a nice weekend here in oil country. Cass, fantastic as always. Catch up with you on the post game show. Absolutely, buddy. Look forward to it. That's our game analyst, Matt Cassian, with Gabe Changers, brought to you as always by David Bunting. Remax Elite. If you're looking to buy a home, go and see Damon. If you're looking to sell a home, Go and see Damon. He's absolutely tremendous to deal with and uh, just overall a great guy. Okay, 11 games on the schedule tonight. Busy Saturday. Not as busy as some Saturdays earlier in the year, but let's get you up to speed on what is going on right now, what has happened earlier in the day, and it all started with Pittsburgh beating Tampa. That's huge because the Pens are in the mix now. All of a sudden, they're like the Undertaker. They're just rising. Rising 83 points. They have, for the time being, put themselves into the second wild card spot in the Eastern Conference. They're 6 2 and 2 in their last 10. They've won four straight. They have five games remaining. The Flyers, meanwhile, 2 5 and 3 in their last 10, also have five games remaining. And uh, they have identical 36 30 and 11 records, the two teams from Pennsylvania. But the Pens own uh, the tiebreaker and are all of a sudden in a playoff spot for now. So they win it 5-4 to four over the Lightning earlier in the day, and then those Boston Bruins celebrating their centennial beat the Florida Panthers 3-2 to two in overtime at TD Garden. Then you had Chicago beating the Dallas Stars. Do you think people in Dallas are freaking out after that one? Probably a few of them. Not so much. No? Yes? You kind of did this. I don't think actually yeah, a whole lot. My, my buddy texted me. He's like, ah, it's one of those games. He was like, oh. he was pretty choked. He was like, unbelievable. Yeah. But uh, he was like, nah, like it's every, every team has one of those games. Okay. Okay. Winnipeg, 4 2 winners over Minnesota in mini at XL Energy Center. San Jose, 3 2 win over St. Louis. They're done. The Blues are, as are the Sharks, obviously. That one in overtime earlier in the day. Columbus leading Philly. Right now, 6-2, to two, 40 seconds left in the game. The Flyers in big-time trouble. 2-5-2 two, and two going into this one in their last 10. Yeah, John Tortorella trying to be a darling to the media the other day. I don't buy that crap for two seconds. I know 
Belzy was trying to get me going earlier on Hello Hockey. Not happening. And uh, the Flyers respond with a stinker against the Columbus Blue Jackets. Oh, well, that's too bad, John. Uh, 4-2, Toronto leads Montreal. Five minutes left in the third period at Bell Centre. Uh, the Devils up 4-3 to three over the Sens at Canadian Tire Centre in Ottawa. Five minutes left in the third. They're also in the third period. 11 minutes remaining. The Islanders lead the Nashville Predators. The Islanders looking to stay alive in the Eastern Conference playoff race. They have 83 points. They are in the Metro Division, however, so they do have third place in the Metro, as of right now, they had just won three straight. Big thank you to Johnny Boychuk from the Islanders for popping by on Hello Hockey as well. And Tyler Smith, uh, who was on that Humboldt team that went through that horrific, horrific crash six years ago today. I can't believe it's been that long. And uh, if you didn't hear it, Smitty, a, a great guy. I've gotten to know him over the years, done some hockey schools with him, golfed with him, just hung out with him. He uh, was great, absolutely tremendous, kind of gave us a, a bit of a a look at what everyone's doing, how they, they stay strong and, and all that. So check out Hello Hockey if you get a chance uh, from earlier in the day. A couple more scores or uh, games coming up. you got Edmonton and Calgary, and then the late one has Vancouver in L.A. So we'll keep an eye on that one. Faux show, if you're looking at the standings right now, the Canucks still lead the Pacific, have basically all year, 102 points through 76 games. Edmonton second with 97 through 75 games, and uh, the Golden Knights. Ouch, what a tough loss yesterday in Arizona. Six unanswered. Six unanswered. They were up 4-1. They lose 7-4 to the Coyotes. Uh, they're at 92 points, third in the Pacific. They have six games remaining. And then you've got the Preds at 92 points. And the Kings at 91 points. The Blues basically done, especially after losing again to San Jose. The Wild done. Uh, the Kraken done. And the Flames, who we'll see tonight, obviously no chance. They are done. Beautiful. All right. Chris Knobloch did speak to the media about an hour ago. We have that for you. Let's go to the Oilers head coach. Bounce back performance last night against Colorado. I mean, what can you say about the standard that's set in that dressing room from the leaders to kind of have a bounce back performance like that absolutely the guys were disappointed with the way the game went in dallas and um you know i was, had a lot of confidence that they were going to respond and they have so well um after a poor performance and um you know we played a pretty good game 60 minutes and um you know it's important tonight that we don't have a letdown um calgary Saturday night, very emotional game, team that works very hard. Um, you know, we can feel good about our game the other night against Colorado, but it uh, doesn't mean very much if we allow two points getting away from us tonight. The points percentage on home ice is nearly perfect in the last 10 games, but on the road, you're 2-4-2. Two, and two. Is there anything about your road game that you're hoping to kind of improve a little bit? Just, um, I think a lot of it is just puck management, playing with the same intensity that um, we've been playing with at home. I think we're excited and um, like playing in front of the home crowd, obviously, and so many teams do. But um, we need to have that same emotion when we're on the road. Can we expect any lineup changes tonight outside of the goaltender? Just goaltending change. Everything else will stay the same. Any thoughts on the MVP race? A lot in the media has been made of how it's basically coming down to McDavid, Kucherov, McKinnon. I'm sure you have your pick in the race, obviously, but just the fact that it seems like it's so close between all three players. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously I'm very biased on who I think. Um, I see a guy that plays every night and um, very worthy of um, winning that trophy. And uh, obviously those other players are very um, having great seasons and their teams are doing well. Um, just for me, what I see what Connor does for our team every night um, is... Um, in my opinion, should be a leading candidate. All right, that was Chris Knobloch. Short and sweet. You heard it there. No lineup changes outside of the netminder. So Calvin Pickard, like we expected, getting the nod in goal for the Oilers. At the other end of the, other end of the rink, it will be Jacob Markstrom. Uh, Pickard has an 11-6 record this season, a 240 goals against average, 911 save percentage, one shutout in 19 games this season. He had that shared team shutout. Where was that? In Pittsburgh? Am I remembering that correctly? Remember it was on the road? 
I can look it up. I've got the teams. I got the whole schedule right here. Right here, Trev, unless you have it already. Anyway, just the one shutout officially. The other one had to be a team shutout. What was it? I don't know. I'm drawing a blank here, It was Tommy. Pittsburgh. It was Pittsburgh? Nothing. Yeah, I got it. Boom. Oh, Called it. Out of me. Out of me, Tommy. Thank you. Sometimes I still remember stuff, oh. even though I'm a little bit older. Not so much wiser. Uh, at the other end of the rake, 34-year-old Jacob Markstrom, 23-20-2 this year, 274 goals against average, 906 save percentage. Two shutouts for Markstrom in 45 games this year. Lifetime versus Edmonton, 15-16-2 record, 299 GAA, 900 save percentage, one shutout in 33 games versus the Oil. Uh, Pickard versus the Flames, not a great record. Looking for his first win. It will be the sixth time he faces Calgary in his NHL career. 386 GAA, 879 save percentage, and uh, maybe he does get that first win versus the Flames in his career. All right, let's get to some text. I want to do that. We can go back inside the Flames locker room. Nah, we can do that in a couple of minutes. Nah, I don't know. Corky from an airplane. It says, test from the airplane, Corky. Corky. He passed the test. Well done. Uh, Chris <laughs> Chris says the best rivalry right now is Cass versus the mute button. And he does it on every show. Two he, guys. He does have a history of it. Yeah. But this, uh, this I don't know what, what was happening earlier today. Like he, he said it was just the computer. It's the new systems messing with his what computer. Mean? So... Or whatever his mic is, or, okay. or well, he's something. got a new he's got a new camera that he's using, but yeah, I don't know. It's uh, something's going on there. Something's but uh, he says he didn't mute. He didn't mute himself today, and I actually believe him because usually I can see him click the mute button. Okay, and uh, he, his hands were up uh, the whole time, so I don't know what was going on there. But that is a pretty good rivalry. That is a good rivalry. <laughs> the mute button's kicking his ass. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> Uh, another text comes in and says, hey, does sitting one game even help that much? If you're banged up, probably does a little bit. That extra day of rest, uh, you can rest your mind a little bit too. The uh, the nervous energy, if you know you're not playing, and it's for rest purposes, not because you haven't been playing well. I think it can help in that regard, but in these last seven, like Cass said, the way you kind of quote-unquote rest guys is you just don't play them as much. So like McDavid drives, do they need 20 minutes a night? Probably not. Probably not. All right, let's go to this one. It says, uh, not so much now, but those Red Wings-Avs games back in the day were always crazy to watch. Yes, they were insane. If you if you don't know what we're talking about, just do a YouTube search. Avs, Red Wings, I think it was late 90s, 97, 98-ish, into the early 2000s. We're talking Draper, Maltby, Lemieux, McCarty, um, Patrick Waugh fighting Mike Vernon. Those were some battles. Adam Foote was in there. Yeah, that was that was wild stuff way back then. So uh, check it out if you haven't. And it's not so much the same as it was back then, but, man, craziness, craziness. Uh, I like this one. I like this one. It's from Shimani, first-time caller, long-time listener. TG is all world. Oil in a tight one. This is Flames Cup Run. Or is it ruined? Shimani, thanks for chiming in. I like it. You know what? We're getting a lot more new numbers coming in. I've noticed that. I think that's a great trend. Yeah, it's solid. A, thank you for listening and watching. B, thank you for taking part in the conversation. This is why we do this. Fantastic. Shimani, thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, look forward to having many discussions over the coming years in regard to hockey, sports, and uh, the Wall Street Pre and Post Game Show. Uh, Mikey says, thanks for the interview with Tyler Smith on Hello Hockey. Great to see him helping others and sharing his story. Mikey, yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mikey. And I I was kind of like, Ugh, do, do I leave Smitty alone? And I kind of, I was like, oh, yeah, it's coming up. But I wasn't 100% sure, and I didn't double check. A bunch of stuff was going on, and, I was like, shoot, today is the anniversary, and Smitty was great. Absolutely tremendous. The kid's a pro, um, and uh, he he gave us the scoop on where he's at, how he's doing, how he's trying to help others. Highly, highly, highly recommend uh, checking out today's edition of Hello Hockey. 
Let's go see what's going on in the nasty chat. Is everybody behaving over there? Uh, Jenna says Pickard is due. Book it. What else is going on? Pickard will annihilate the flames with laser-like Hocus Pocus. And Hocus Focus says Ace 96. Some stranger agrees that that is some rivalry between Cass and the mute button. Um, some good text going on in the nasty chat. All right, YouTube Trev, where you at? With uh, tonight's game, yeah, uh, yeah, Tommy, I'm, I'm a little, you know what? Honestly, I, th- I think some nasties brought up a good point. Like, they have been extremely healthy, and I've like, there's been a few times Vogel went into the boards awkwardly the last game. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I do want the Oilers to, you know, obviously show up tonight. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, you know, if they lose. Look, the bigger picture is they're heading into the playoffs, and I'd rather you know them head into the playoffs with a complete healthy roster. Yeah. And so, if if they lose this one, and, and it's the Flames, right? So I'm I'm kind of uh, I I want them to bring it, but at the same time, I I don't like you know like there there is risk when you're playing the Flames. Like obviously of the course. Flames the Flames are going to bring it there, yeah. and so uh, that's that's one thing I'm going to be keeping a keen eye on is just. You know, like play it safe, and if you're down, obviously, like try, to, like don't completely give up. But at the same time, uh, I'm just worried. I, I really am. And it, if it was anyone else besides the Flames, and it's seven games left, you know, the the Oilers, it's just, I don't know. So that's that's one thing. Uh, I'm I'm kind of worried. I'm kind of worried on that, Tommy. I understand. Yep. Here is the Flames roster for tonight. You've got Kadri between Kuzmenko and Pospisil, Backlund centering Sharon Govich and Coleman, Zary with Huberto and Hunt. Rooney between Greer and Coronado. This is from Derek Wills, play-by-play voice of the Calgary Flames on the radio side. On defense for Calgary tonight, Uyghur with Miramanov, Shillington with Anderson, Gilbert with Pahal, and then between the pipes, like we mentioned, Jacob Markstrom. For the Oilers, you heard Chris Knobloch say it. No changes to the roster outside of Calvin Pickard getting starts. So that's McDavid between Drysaddle and Hyman. Nugent Hopkins with Henrik and Fogel. McLeod with Kane and Perry. Ryan between Yanmark and Brown on defense. Ekholm with Bouchard. Nurse with CeCe. Kulak with DeArnay. No Stetcher. No Carrick for the Orange. And Blue. Okay, let's go inside the Flames locker room one more time. They did hold a morning skate. Standard media avail. Oilers did not after flying in after their 6-2 victory over the Colorado Avalanche here in Edmonton last night. So let's go to uh, the man who's had some good nights against the Oilers over the course of his career, whether it was as a Leaf, as an Avalanche, and as a Flame, Nazem Kadri. Well, despite uh, where everything is uh, in the standings and everything that's going on, it's nothing like uh, having a chance to play with your rivals. It's just the team's approach to uh, the Oilers game team. Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't, I don't think it really takes much to get up for these type of games. And, uh, you know, that's exciting for us. I'm sure exciting for them. And, um, you know, they're always fun games to watch and be a part of. So, uh, you know, looking for more of that tonight. What does this matchup look like from your vantage point? I mean, we can, again, look at the standings or we can look at what we know about both teams. But from your vantage point, what's this matchup look like? Um, exciting. I think, uh, I mean, regardless of... Where the teams are sitting, I mean, I think both teams are just focused on getting a win tonight and worrying about tonight. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, a pretty special rivalry we got in the game of hockey, and it's always fun uh, competing against these guys. What's, uh, like, when it comes to, is it different? Battle Club or rivalry versus like a different game on a Tuesday night. It's very like, like it's just natural for the emotions to be heightened. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, you know pretty obvious. I mean, I think uh, Saturday night against your uh, your biggest rival, of course. Um, it's a great storyline for everybody to talk about, but uh, you know, for us, I think it's. No, much more the same. We want to just continue to build those good habits and uh, you know feel good about ourselves uh, leading up to the end of the season. And uh, this is an opportunity to do that tonight. You, you've been asked a trillion times, but is there a way you, you can try to slow down 29 and 97 on that front? Have you, have you figured out how to adapt to that? You just you know got to try to play physical and uh, get in their way early. I mean, obviously, there are guys that like to build a lot of speed and do a lot of damage to the neutral zone. So you know, I think if you can kind of intercept that and... Uh, uh, play ahead of it. You have a better chance, at least. They're obviously great players. So, uh, yeah, just little details. What do you think the Battle of Alberta ranks among the league's best rivalries? Uh, probably number one. Probably number one, honestly. I've been a part of, uh, you know, lots of uh, games like these and lots of rivalries like these. And uh, this is certainly, 
up there in uh, maybe all the sports, really. I mean, I think uh, just obviously geographically being so close, being in the same province and, uh, you know, the the great history that each franchise has, I think it's, uh, you know, it's up there. What did you, uh, what did the group do so well in Edmonton last time? That was a really solid outing. What did you like about it and what can you recreate tonight? Full game. I think we, uh, you know, since for the, uh, the drop of the puck, we came out of the gate hard. We competed hard. We, uh, you know, won a lot of those uh, puck battles that were up for grabs, and I think that's, uh, you know, just the competition level and obviously our preparation leading up to that game and just being able to uh, stay on the gas for 60 minutes I think was really important. There's Nazem Kadri, th- uh, two goals through three games this season versus Edmonton, and over the course of his career, Kadri, pretty good numbers versus the Oilers. He has, where well, I just had it here. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. There it is. 11 goals, 8 assists, 19 points through 22 games versus the Oil. 18 penalty minutes. Uh, also, uh, 15.7% shooting percentage. So, Kadri always dangerous against the Oilers. By the way, the Flames will be wearing their Blasty jersey for the last time this season. Classic. Uh, I don't think it's good. You don't like that? No. Oh, come on, Tommy. I actually didn't mind their Heritage Classic uniform. The Heritage Classic was good. Yeah. It was yeah, I thought it was pretty solid. Modern but throwback, I the guess. The Blasty, it's, it's so sharp. Like, I, I can't stand the flames, but, like, uh, it's such nice contrast. I think, oh, yeah, actually, it's right up there, and I hate saying it, but, like, those are one of my favorite jerseys. Like, the whole uniform looks good. Don't be a hater, Tommy. But I, sp- speaking of jerseys, you guys are talking about jerseys. Yeah, yeah. One you didn't mention. I really like, uh, like, and they kind of brought it back when Taylor Hall was on the jerseys, like the retro New Jersey's, like the green and red, like yeah, the away, right. the white. I think those are pretty slick. Like the Devils? Yeah, 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 those the cool. Devils. Yeah, yeah those like are pretty those. cool. And then even just like the Jets, like the throwback Jets. Yeah. I think those are pretty pretty clean those as well. well done. I am pleasantly surprised with the Jets baby blue, like, 1940s throwback uniforms that they're wearing this year. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a nod to uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force. At first, I didn't really like it, and then I saw it, like, full set on the ice. I was like, that's pretty nice. Now, this might sound, like, awful to some other fans, but I actually like Calgary's regular uniforms. It just, just feels right. Yeah, you know I, I agree. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. I, I think uh, they took a step back when, like, in the 2000s, the early yeah. 2000s, with the, the black the and black red. And yeah. the piping and the no. one weird line through the... Super weird. Yeah. So I, I think uh, I'm with you on that, Tommy. They, they, have a, they have a classic hockey jersey look. Do I love it? No. I just think it's right. And I'm glad they went back to that full time. And then they're wearing that stupid blasty sh- jersey tonight. And then I didn't mind their Heritage Classic uniform. I thought the Heritage Classic was very well done all around, outside of what the Flames wore into Commonwealth Stadium. Ugh. Oh, yeah. I don't need to see that. <laughs> yeah. What is this? What are we watching what here? What are we doing? Yeah. No, that was, uh, that was right. I forgot all about that, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Weird choice. Anyway, uh, that's the aesthetic of the game. The Oilers are just going to wear their regular white, royal, and blue uniforms with the orange classic, and then uh, that's it. They're going to just roll with the, the same two uniforms for the rest of the season. All right, let's see if there's any text as we wind things down. Um, Jason Duke says, Tommy loved the jacket, and if Trev's jacket was totally black, he'd look like a floating head. He's done that before. He's wearing a cool bet hoodie. Cool bet, proud sponsor of uh, EST. And then this one, I have a Hello Hockey one. It's Bauer, Jason, and LaDuke, and uh, Belzy went out and got these for us and then had the logos put on there. But uh, thank you, yeah, it's and it's really comfortable too. So appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Norman of Combine says, hey, Tom. Frank Party says, Norm, what's going on? Where are we at here? What's going on, Nasty Chat? You guys are good? Ryan Corky, is 6 a.m. logger available in the U.S. yet? No. No, not yet. But I know it's in Calgary. My brother who lives down in Calgary sent me a picture. He was at a bar last week, and he's like, look what I found. And I was like, yes, we're taking over. I was just telling you earlier, I had some buds from back home. Uh, mm-hmm. Nice uh, uh, Lethbridge? in Lethbridge. Yeah, nice. good old college party. And then he said, "Is like, is this your beer?" I'm like, "Well, it's our beer." But uh, that beer. was that was the beer that was uh, the beer of choice for that night. Playing beer pong. Let's what go. What they think? 
Yeah, they thought it was amazing. Uh, I've had a few buddies that actually reach out to me, so it's pretty cool. I'm like, wow, it's, uh, it's made its way down to Lethbridge, so it's pretty sweet. Trevor, thank you for agreeing that Blasty is brutal. Um, yes, 6 o'clock or lager is crushable. Not Trevor, Trebor, B-O-R. Trebor? Trebor, yeah. There you go. And, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully have a 6 o'clock or lager or two. Do we have it in the fridge back there? No. I, was, uh, I was looking last night. Okay. Um, for a few. Well, we'll find them. Scott hooked us up with some more beers, so uh, we'll indulge a little bit tonight, maybe have one or two, and then maybe we'll also uh, JBC. I'm, I'm thinking so. Okay, I love it. That's going to be a fun Saturday night. That's going to do it for the Oil Stream pregame show. Can the Oilers make it 3-1 and one versus the Flames this season? They close out the BOA. I think it's going to be a good game down at the Saddle Dome. The Flames are going to give them everything that they've got because they don't want to lose to their provincial rival. You heard Nazem Kadri say it's one of the best, if not the best, rivalry in all of hockey. So make it happen, Nazem Kadri. Piss off some Oilers, and then they'll go after him, and then we'll have some brouhaha's and some brews and some nice goals. And then at the end of the night, maybe we're talking about an Oilers victory. Big thank you to Patty Steinberg from the Fan 960 down at Sportsnet Radio in Calgary. For YouTube, Trev and Maddie Cassian. I'm Tom Gazzola saying thank you as always for tuning in. Whether you watch or listen, you know we love you. Appreciate it. We'll see you on the postgame show. Ciao, ciao.